Okay, I have a comment here um, from uh, Marie Lentini. Hope I'm saying your name right. Um, she writes here, Wow, what a fantastic gift. What are the apocryphal, apocryphal books? And is there a timeline for the history about the King James KJV translations? What is the Vulgate and how does it relate to the KJV? I ask, I, I'm I asking these questions as I was trying to witness to someone going to an apostate Bible college that promotes NIV and ESV above the KJV issue. Sorry if these are basic questions or if you have already or you have already covered them. Thanks and blessings, Sister in Christ Marie. Okay. Well, just to answer your questions really quickly because I replied back and I said I'm going to answer those in an upcoming video. Yes, I do actually have a video on what the apocryphal books are, but to give you just a quick story about what they are, um, there was a Septuagint that was written, and it was written after the New Testament was completed. And uh, they try to tell you, oh, no, it was, it was there, and Jesus and the apostles used it, which is absolute nonsense. And again, study the issue. You'll see Jesus was referring to not one jot or one tittle shall be, you know, passed along until all is fulfilled. Uh, jots and tittles are Hebrew letters. Okay, they weren't reading a Greek uh, Old Testament. That's nonsense. And the whole story of the letter of Orestes and, uh, and all this other stuff. It's, it's just a bunch of junk is all it is. And they, there are no extant uh, copies of a B.C. Septuagint. Okay, in other words, there are no copies that are in a museum someplace or whatever else that are, you know, the apocryphal books and things, the Septuagint, the Greek Septuagint. Um, there are none of those copies out there that are, you know, from before Christ showed up. They're all A.D. copies. And when they created this Septuagint thing, they threw in a bunch of other books which have become known as, as apocryphal or deuterocanonical. Special word there. And uh, they're just words, you know, the books like um, Bell and the Dragon, uh, The Wisdom of Tobit, or I, I don't even know all the names of, of them. I don't really waste much time on them, um, to be honest with you. But they created these books, and they are old, but it's A.D., Okay, it's not BC books, all right? And the reason that you know that it's not something that was actually used by Jesus and the apostles or the early Christians is because there's no, you know, it is written in the book of wisdom or something like this. There's no New Testament quotations where they're directly quoting from those apocryphal books. Now, the translators of the King James Bible put them between the Old and New, Test New Testament because these guys were scholars. They were great men, very extremely intelligent. Um, I mean, study the lives of the translators of the King James Bible. They were very, very uh, highly intelligent men. And they put them between the Old and the New Testament to show these are not part of Old Testament-inspired Scripture, um, but you can study them for a historical quality. Okay? But watch my video. I get into more detail on the, the whole thing of what are the apocryphal books. Question number two was, is there a timeline for the history about the KJV translations? Well, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that as far as, you know, the, the translations that led up to the King James Bible. I'll give you that real quick. Um, you had Tyndale in 1525. Um, before that was uh, Wycliffe. And it's not really a translation per se that led to the King James Bible because Wycliffe did not use the received text. Okay, he was just making a translation of Jerome's Latin Vulgate, right? Um, so I don't include Wycliffe. You know, he did make a written, handwritten, you know, translation of Latin scriptures into English, uh, intending for the common man to have the scriptures and things like that. So that's a good thing. You know, it kind of started the idea of some of the rebellion against the Catholic Church, but wasn't using the right manuscripts. But so you have William Tyndale takes Erasmus's text, uh, the received text, you know, that's not used by the Catholic Church, never was used by the Catholic Church, and he takes that and he makes an English New Testament. The Catholics catch him, put him to death uh, before he can get the Old Testament done, and a contemporary of his, a friend of his, Miles Coverdale, comes out with the whole translation work. He finishes it as the Coverdale version, essentially, in 1535, so about 10 years later. 1537, you have, um, I think it was, it was Thomas Bilney, I think, um, gave, put his name Matthew, you know, in other words, the last name of Matthew, uh, the Matthews translation, because back then they were, they were killing these guys, right and left, the Catholics were. 
Then after that, you had the Great Bible, commissioned by King Henry VIII. And uh, that was, again, in the same line of the received text-type Bibles. After that, you had the Geneva translation, which was done by the Puritans. Then you had the Anglicans doing the Bishop's Bible, which is right there. The Bishop's Bible, there's uh, three volumes right there. Volume 1, Volume 2, Old Testament. There is New Testament right here. And over here is actually the Dewey Reims, um, Roman Catholic uh, Bible, New Testament, 1582. Old Testament, whole Bible in 1610 came out one year before the King James Bible. So I have a lot of these old Bibles and things like that. Obviously not original copies, but, you know, original editions, obviously. But uh, then you had, after that, you had the seventh one in the line of received text Bibles would be the authorized version known today as the King James Version, okay, which is what I use and preach from here. And that was translated between 1604 to 1611. Now, after that, you had the Gothic font. Um, so you have your authorized version done in 1611, but you had the Gothic font and their hand setting the type. In other words, they had little metal dies with a letter on it, and you got to put them into a wooden frame backwards, and then you put the piece of paper on top, the old Gutenberg press, and you bring the press over, you put the ink on the metal, you know, little letters sticking up, and then put the paper on, bring the press over, and you pull the handle, and it pushes down like that, and then you got your paper there. Um, very difficult. And, of course, there were some times where they would get a letter mixed up or they would have a word in the wrong area or whatever else. I mean, it's just, that's going to be that way even with modern-day printing. You're going to have printing errors and words that are spelled wrong in first editions and things, and those need to be corrected. Okay, that doesn't negate from the perfection of the King James Bible. The translation was correct. And again, I remember hearing the one time that they actually found some of the old translator's notes um, that these guys were writing and stuff by hand, um, and it was the right translation, like what we, you know, it's the right wording and the right spelling and things like that, that wasn't correct until years later with the printing, some of the printing difficulties that they had at first. And, you know, but the translators had notes that were showing the right readings, you know. So, uh, you know, people try to make a big thing out of that, that they're older printing errors, so it can't be God's perfect word or something. It's absurd, absolutely absurd. And, of course, you have... Gothic S's could be spelled two ways. You have an S and then you have kind of the long, like a big, it looks like the letter F. And U, the letter U, oftentimes look like a V. Um, again, you have font changes going from Gothic font to Roman font. So the King James Bible's finished in 1611, but then they refine it and make it better and better and better until 1769. And that's what you're going to get with your Cambridge Bible today, uh, King James Bible like this. Um, best Bibles are Cambridge Bibles, Bibles, in my opinion. The Oxfords are okay, but the Oxford edition, again, there's some slight variations between the two. It's mostly publishers that are putting that thing out. Not going to affect doctrine one bit. Okay, so uh, hopefully, hopefully that answers that question. Number Question number three, what is the Vulgate and how does it relate to the King James Version? Well, um, shortly after the New Testament was, was written, you have uh, Acts chapter 2, the Lord is speaking and having the, the early Christians speak in tongues and, and, you know, all these different languages. So it's obvious that the Lord isn't just saying, my word must only be in Greek, only in Greek, you know. No, he's, he's for translations, proper translations. And uh, see, the, the, the whole issue is not about proper and improper translation. That's really not the, the big deal with the Bible version issue. It's talking about two completely different Greek texts from different parts of the world, okay? Here, I'll put this in my right hand. My right hand, you have the received text that was used by the King James translators, and here you have the Nestle's text, which is used by the Roman Catholic Church, all right? That's the real issue here, all right? And they can both squabble over, uh, well, it should be translated, and it should be this, and it should be that. And I always like to say to these new versionists, they'll say, the King James you know, version is a very poor translation. I say, of the Nestle's text, yes, you're correct about that. <laughs> the Roman Catholic text that they used from the Egyptian text that they used. King James Bible is a, the Texas Receptus is a Syrian text. Antioch, Syria, where they were first called Christians. Acts chapter 11, verse 26. So, 
they're making these translations, they're taking the scriptures, they're of course writing them out by hand, and they're not carrying around full, you know, Bibles like this in the first century, but they're, people are getting pages and the scriptures are being faithfully copied and things like that, uh, because God's part of that, um, you know, and if you have some errors and things like that, some spelling errors and whatever else, you would get somebody, oh man, you spelled this word wrong and they'd fix it and stuff, just like the printing errors of the original 1611, the way that they were doing it. You know, it's very hard to get it perfect each time and things. Um, again, it doesn't mean that God's Word is not perfect because somebody put a letter in the wrong place or something like that, or some guy, you know, didn't quite get it spelled right or something, and some later guy comes and goes, wait a second, he's comparing, and he goes, yeah, I'll have to change that to this proper thing here because some guy made a mistake. God's going to be there. See, supernaturally preserving his word through the whole thing. So there was an old Latin Bible that was created. And again, we're not dealing with a whole Old Testament, Genesis to Revelation. We're dealing with portions of Scripture where the, they were saying, okay, Latin's a pretty popular language back here in the first couple of centuries after the New Testament is, is completed. And they're going in and they're saying, okay, we're going to write out some manuscripts here and stuff like this. We'll translate from Greek which was the language that was originally used there to write down the scriptures, will translate from Greek to Latin. And Vulgate is basically a word coming from vulgar. It doesn't mean profanity. It just means the common people's language. The common people's language at, you know, after the Bible was completed eventually became Latin, so they're writing it out in Latin. All right? So there's pages of scripture, and lots of these old Latin Vulgates are you know, around there. Well... When the Catholic Church was starting to be formed, you had uh, about the 4th century or so, late 4th century, you had a man named Jerome, who was basically a Catholic scholar. Jerome um, was commissioned, I think it was by Augustine, I could be wrong on that, but um, Jerome was commissioned to make a revision, a new version of the old Latin Vulgate and put it into an entire Bible. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? We need the NIV and the ESV and whatever else to update the King James Bible. See, this is the one that's used by common people today and has been used for a long time. But now the Catholics come out and they say, oh, well, it's, it's old, it's archaic, it's outdated. We need to update it. You see, not much changes. And so they started to take these old Latin Vulgate things and stuff and they, they were saying, oh, we got Jerome's Latin Vulgate now. It was finished. Right around 405, excuse me, 405 A.D., he was commissioned, I think, 380 A.D. to make the translation. Took him, you know, 25 years approximately. Um, I'm just a lot of this. I'm quoting from memory, so don't, don't, you know, take this as just documented truth. Okay, um, you can look up a lot of this information, and you know, and again, I'm getting my information from the books I've read on this issue. Uh, but I'm trying to answer your question quickly, but. Um, and so, you know, the old Latin Vulgate is out there and gradually it's replaced by Jerome's Latin Vulgate, the Catholic new version of its day. Uh, same thing that they've been trying to do with the King James Bible. So, um, a really good book, which I recommend. I have some issues with the guy that wrote it, but uh, his book is still, I believe, the best one. Um, and that is The Answer Book, a help book for Christians by Dr. Sam Gipp. Uh, this book right here. We handed this thing out for years and years and years. Uh, it has a lot of, of uh, you know, answers to your questions on the Bible version issue. This was the first one I ever had. And, um, you know, really good book. Very simple, very easy to understand. And uh, so I'd recommend you get a book like that if you want more information. It's available at chick.com. It's not a very expensive book. Um, you know, don't just rely on online sources and things. It's good to have some offline things that you can, you know, look up and whatever. I mean, you don't need all these books, but, it's, you know, I think it's important to have a few books like that, printed, written books. Okay? So, that is going to be it. I hope I've answered your questions. You can watch my um, FAQ series, you know, and I get into a lot of the different Bible version issue questions and things. Uh, watch my documentary on my secondary channel. I have it on this channel, but it's broke up into pieces and it's not the high definition. Uh, but my secondary channel, 
um, you can go check that out there. The real Bible version issue exposed. Uh, you can go check out that and uh, get into a lot of the details on uh, the Bible version issue, show the documentation, show the proof, talk about Tyndale and a lot of this other stuff. So, um, and show that the Catholics are definitely behind the new versions. So, uh, that should be it. So, thank you for watching. Very good questions. Uh, thank you for watching and very good questions. I'll say it that way. All right. So, we'll see you in the next video.